Hey everyone, welcome to Pop XP. And before the show starts, make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content. And don't forget, if you can, make sure to share our stream on all your social media outlets. We appreciate it, and thanks for helping us grow the Pop XP channel. Look at that. Episode 19, excuse me, issue 19 of the new Steve and Samino Says Boom show on the Pop XP. Steve, this is a big deal. We're on a new platform, and the guy down below isn't isn't a better looking auto. It's the <laughs> Neil, the Nile, the superstar Scala from the Pop XP. Nile, tell everybody. Who you are and what's going on, because they probably know you better than me and Steve over here. Yes, yes. And if they remember last week, we introduced you guys onto the Pop XP, uh, you know, the, the channel of Billy Tucci and Niall Scala. And this is it, man. You guys are part of the family. You're part of us. We've leveled up in the world, my friends. So not only are you here uh, enjoying Steve and Samino Says Boom Show, which is also part of the crowdfunding comics network, as well as the Pop XP mainstream. So, guys, this is going to be great. I'm really excited to 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 be your engineer. You know, Samino, take the wheel. Copilot Steve, you guys do it. I'm just here. I'm here for the ride to help you guys out, and it's going to be a well, great time. Well, I'm excited, and uh, and uh, what a what a way to start the show. Just to let people know, the rest of our catalog can be found on this channel and on the and on our old YouTube channel. So you can always get that. The one through uh, issues one through 18, they're going to have new thumbprints. It's going to look better than ever. Like I said, Niall is taking reins of the ship because me and my Ookla, the mock over here, Steve Houston, we don't know technology that well. So Steve, the co-host, what do you got to say about this new, uh, this new format and what we got going on today? Okay, first things first, I love that little intro. I yeah. think it looks magnificent. I uh, I just love that. So of course, that's the first time that I've ever seen it. Me too. And I cannot imagine a better way to start than having two of my ultimates on the show at the same time. Uh, anyone who knows me is sick and tired of me talking about these guys. <laughs> They're like, oh, God, please, Steve, stop. So uh, this is a, a, a very special occasion. One, we're on a new platform. And two, we're starting off with what I consider a huge bang. Yeah, okay. So everybody out there, what way to start off with the former editor-in-chief and an artist extraordinaire expert? Okay. We'll bring them in without further ado. Niall, why don't you announce them? Because because you're the you're the uh like I said, you're the brains behind this. I don't I'm, we're not much brain. brains, we're just go. fanboys. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, our first guests now on, on this platform right here, Mr. Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends. Hey guys. Uh, <laughs> hi guys. How you doing? Okay, hello, hello. look at these two legends. Now, to introduce <laughs> these guys on this new platform. Okay. In the 60s, you had Stan and Jack. In the 70s, you had Roy and John Buscema. In the 80s, you had Chris Claremont and John Byrne. In the 90s, things changed. The industry changed. But two guys were the bearer of hope of this storytelling of days past. All this big bright lights from Image and all these other comics that I don't, I couldn't understand it. I needed something and we, I needed a glint of hope as you might say. And I know Steve will agree with me. These two guys right here, 
Tom DeFalco, Ron Friends, the the bearers of hope in the 90s, former <laughs> editor in chief. Of, I don't know how many awards you won too, Ron. It, it, it's just incredible to have you guys here. You guys meant so much to the industry and so much to guys like me and Steve and everybody Man. that just wanted, didn't want the big blast. We wanted the core. We wanted those those stories from days long ago and nobody held that banner better than you guys so i just have to say thank you tom and thank you ron for being here with us on our new platform thank you very much john it's been a pleasure you guys take care wow. have a good time. <laughs> thanks for coming on <laughs> yeah. well I, okay. I guess we're done <laughs> Tom, oh. do you have any idea what he's talking about do you have any idea what the hell he's talking about yeah, the image stuff was all this exciting stuff, and you and I did this, you know, basic boring stuff. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> hey, it doesn't matter if you guys don't know as long as I know, and that's the best thing because, like I said, you guys had this comic storytelling that was what I grew up with and what I wanted because in the 90s I started losing interest. And then were you guys with Thor that started it all? Oh, my God. Steve, tell them. I Tell them. I can't. I can't. Well, um, you know, obviously, uh, Ron has gone through the gauntlet when he came to a signing. He had to put up with me for a couple of days. The poor guy was just like, every time I walked in, he, I know that he put his head down. I was like, oh, God, here he is again. You know, um, <laughs> I can't say how much I adore uh, both of these creators. For me, there's a little a hint of sadness here as well. Because uh, Ron Friends and Tom DeFalco were the last comic creators to ever give me that rush, that like, oh man, I have to get that next month's issue. I, 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 I turn the last page and I'm like, okay, I'm waiting for the next month. Um, that doesn't happen anymore, and I'm, I'm, and I'm being deadly serious here. Um, the comics that uh, you guys did. You know, of course, you know, going all the way back to the 80s. Uh, for me, was my last hurrah at Marvel and comics in general. And I've never been able to enjoy comics as much. And I have spent the last 15 years explaining to people about your skill sets, about what you're able to do about storytelling and about action, slam bang action. Okay, if you want to have 25 pages of someone going to Starbucks and talking about Oh, whoa, well, me, that's not going to be a Tom DeFalco and Ron Friend story. That's no. not what it's going to be. Okay. If you want to have a painted story by David Mack of flowers falling down and butterflies, that's not going to be Tom DeFalco <laughs> and Ron Friend. Okay. Um, so for me, I, in my position, you know, obviously working at Torpedo and, you know, uh, being just able to speak to people and say, hey, by the way, what, what have you ever read? What did you read? And they're like, oh, you know, I read this. Oh, I never read that. And I can always say, oh, you never read this? Okay, let me throw you a couple of books here. Let me give you a couple. Oh, I don't. Yes. Put it in your hand because you're going to read this and you're going to come back and you're going to tell me. Um, so I have been using my position as, you know, a mouthpiece for many years to push you guys and to let people know uh, exactly what it is you br brought to the plate. So that's, again, you guys are like heroes to me. I know it sounds weird because I know you both, you're like, oh, come on now. Uh, but for me, uh, what John said is exactly true. In the in the 70s, for me, Roy Thomas and John Buscema were my gods. I was like, oh my God, these guys are magnificent. These are brilliant, okay? Um, you know, and I never thought that in the 90s I would be having so much fun reading yeah. comics while everyone else, you know, around me was like, oh, God, it's not as good. I was like, no, 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 no. Take a look at this stuff that's going on. Uh, so I always that's how I want to start this show. I want yeah. to let you guys how much your work meant to me. And as I said, no one has approached what you have been able to do for me personally. And, ha and hence, I don't read modern comics anymore. Yeah. Uh, so when you guys went away, basically, I went away too. Yeah. It, what I know we're praising you guys right now for the first five minutes, but I just have to say that it's true, though. Me and Steve were very the same in our collecting and our I look I, like I couldn't take that new stuff. And when you are, your stuff started, when I started discovering your stuff, it was 
That's what I want. That's comics. And once again, you guys had a good time. Now, okay, let's just go back now. Tom first and then Ron. Tom, what was the first comic that you read that, like, got you so into this stuff that you you knew that you had to get into that direction? You had to do it for a living. What was that? Um, well, the first comic book I read was it was some Batman comic book that uh, one of my, my cousins had handed to me. And, um, uh, you know, previous to that, I was into comic strips. Uh, Phantom, Mandrake, Pogo Possum. You know, I, I, I loved comic strips and I used to cut them out of the newspaper, hopefully after my father had read the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on occasion, I got there too soon and, and I heard about it. Um, <laughs> and... Um, and then I, my, my cousin showed me this thing called the comic book. And I remember this Batman creature scared the hell out of me. But I was intrigued by this, you know, concept of comic books. And, and then I discovered, hey, the local candy store has them too. And, and from then I would, on, I was just kind of hooked on comic books. What was the year on this, Tom? Oh, I, I don't know. I guess I was about seven, eight years old. Um. You know, uh, 1958, 59, some, somewhere around there. Wow. And you, Ron? Well, I was born in 60. I have a brother that's three years older, Randall. And it may be apocryphal, but we've kind of come to the agreement that the first comic either one of us remembers was a world's finest comic uh, from 1964 that he would have been responsible for bringing into the house. Um I forget the number, but it had Superman and Batman standing in front of some stone graves where Robin and Jimmy Olsen had faked their own deaths. <laughs> yes. And they were in the background going, <laughs> while Superman and Batman were, were agonizing over their deaths. Um, so we've kind of agreed that, that that seems to be somewhere around the beginning. Um, and then for me, we, we were big Batman fans The you know when the TV show came on. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, George Reeves, Superman series, the Spider-Man 67 cartoon. Yeah, and yeah. around that same time, I had traded some comic books with a friend, and there were some Marvel tales that had some Steve Ditko Spider-Man stories in it. But the first Spider-Man I bought off the racks was number 60. Ramita was already on board. Mm. It was a king, the one where Kingpin's swinging him around by his ankles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I never looked back after that. Around, I, I've drawn from the time I can remember. Uh, I can't remember a time when I wasn't. Uh, nobody can. Uh, so it it was always a very natural thing for me. As Tom said, you know, copying things in the newspapers, but then when we started reading comics and everything, superheroes were just always a part of my uh, my fantasy world. Now, before I throw this to Steve, I got to ask you one more thing, Tom and Ron. Tom, um, what was who was the writer like that inspired you to start writing like? That, that like the one comic you read or that, that one writer that just got you in that because you know you, you got a good I answer Tom's. I, Edgar Rice Burroughs that's, that's it <laughs> Tom what was mine yeah. what What was mine I answered yours what was mine yeah, you, the writer that inspired you yeah. yeah that inspired me the most see if you don't know then our relationship is completely wrong <laughs> all of this has been a lie Look at I, we already I got assume, Spock flying. Spock's a flying. I assume it was Stan. Oh, I don't know. No, I was going to think so. I was, you know, you know, Doctor Seuss. Doctor Seuss. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm always really. I always love it when you rhyme stuff. You know, when when you write the poetry and it. Mm. <laughs> well, you did it in J two and everything. Don't look at me. Oh well, yeah. No. When well, they you write verse. It's great. <laughs> he could have been a great poet. He'd be poor and be you're being interviewing from a box right now, but he could have been a great poet. <laughs> I, I I've sold some professional poetry. I told you that story. <laughs> Look, I feel like we're in a diner in New York City right? in Brooklyn and we're like listening to these guys at the diner. <laughs> and he, He's once, a and he, once predicted, he once predicted that comic books were gonna go the way of poetry and become a tiny little uh, uh, cottage industry where everybody was self-publishing and that there would not be any real major publishers anymore 
of, of, super, of superheroes. It was going to go the way of poetry. And uh, Tom is, is seldom wrong about proclamations. He's very well, careful about his proclamations. You might I, be yes, right on I, that one. What? Well, so you may well, be right on that one. Yeah, yeah well, th these days I think you, you have more people wanting to create comic books than you have people actually reading comic books. <laughs> Oh, oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. All right, Steve, go ahead, brother. All right, Tom. Uh, I want to start with you. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm very well versed in your uh, career at Marvel. Um, but I was just looking up some uh, reference material for you, and I see that you actually broke in as an editorial assistant at Archie. Um, yeah. Back in 1972, which would make you 22 years old at the time. So I'm curious as to how you would go from, I mean, I don't know what work you were doing before that, whether you were at college. How did you end up in a position where you're actually editing a comic company? <laughs> um, well, previous to that, I was in college. And while I was in college, um, I, you know, started to, to write, sold some short stories, you know, did some writing for the local newspapers, uh, a uh, local PR firm and the college PR firm and was doing a weekly comic strip because um, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I, you know, thought of myself more going in the direction of Edgar Rice Burroughs than, than Stan. Uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, I, you know, always wanted to be a writer. And then when I graduated college, I, you know, had grown up with the idea that you had to have a job. Um, it never occurred to me that you could just be a, a freelance writer. Um, and I had, you know, I went to a couple of magazines where I showed, you know, sold some short stories. And they said, you know, you're a writer. You should stay home and write. And I said, but I need a job. And then um, I uh, thought, well, you, you know, you like comics and send some resumes out to the different comic book companies, which is probably the worst way in, in creation to get a job in the comic book industry. But um, the guys at Archie, you know, saw my resume, invited me in for an interview and, and offered me a job. Wow. So, and I, I remember the first day there, I spent most of the morning uh, opening up the, the mail for Dear Betty and Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> Were you writing the answers, Tom? <laughs> no, no. I, I was just opening the mail and, and checking to see if kids had sent in quarters for the Archie Club. Ah. You know, oh. Uh, a so gentleman on his face. They were trusting you with the quarters. So. I know. I, was... <laughs> I don't know how much they trusted me, but... Uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of Joe Edwards was, was the guy who uh, did those Dear Betty and Veronica pages. He was also the, the artist of Little Jinx and a bunch of other things. Great artist, great, great guy. Wait a minute. So it wasn't Betty or Veronica that answered these questions? No, I, I, I hate to bring <laughs> um, it. <laughs> Ron, it would have been nice. I'm sorry, Ron. I tear down my entire childhood. <laughs> I, I have to prepare you for these decisions by that strip. <sighs> no so way. this uh, at this time, obviously, you're very young. <laughs> uh, you're surrounded by all you know, all sorts of people. Some of these people who have maybe been in the industry for a very long, long, long time. And uh, from what I can see, it didn't take you too long to actually actually start writing and actually producing some product for the, for Archie. Well, yeah, I I wanted to be a writer, so right away I started writing one page gags for, for the company took me about six months or so. And then, then I finally uh, convinced the editor that my stuff was good enough to actually start buying. And then from the one page gags, you started to do five page stories and um, you know, you just kept, kept producing stories. Hey Tom, did you base any of those Archie's on your love life? Uh, <laughs> I base those Archie stories on anything I can imagine. <laughs> you know? I wonder what the source was. <laughs> you know, you, you, you know everything. You just read the paper, and, and we're desperate to find the gag. Um, and uh, you know, in those days, what I 
what I loved about Archie and, and still love about Archie, because I still work for Archie every once in a while. Just, I've still got a couple of assignments for next week to do. Wow. Um, but um, what I loved about it in those days is we could play with the medium. We could do stories in rhyme. We did stories where you, you, you'd have one word and, and just use that word to propel your story you know, through, through your five pages or, you know, silent stories and just all sorts of craziness. We could put Archie in any time period and just, just have a ball. So we were only limited by um, imaginations. And I was surrounded by some incredible talents. This uh, gentleman by the name of Frank Doyle, who, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest Archie writer of all time. No, nobody's even close. And George Glatta. Um, you know, these guys could put stories together. It was just, I was in awe watching them and, and you know, fabulous artists. Um, it, was, it was, it was a great time. So obviously at this time, you're, you know, you're beginning your career, you're getting ready, you're, you're getting your feet wet in the writing. Were you actually reading some superhero comics? Were you aware of what was going on over at Marvel and DC and other publishers? And were you even thinking in your, at that time in your mind, I wonder if I'm going to better get over and do some of that stuff myself? Um, you know, yes and no. I, I was reading a lot of comic books. I was a big comic book fan. I was a, a, a Roy Thomas geek. Uh, <laughs> you know, still am. Uh, I love Stan stuff. Uh, you know, when you said, you know, Roy and John, yeah, you know, man, I was there. I loved all that stuff. I, I love what Chris Claremont and John Byrne were doing. I guess, you know, there was so much great stuff coming out. And um, I thought, you know, maybe I could do some of the, you know, uh, the occasional horror story or, or, or you know, mystery story. Um, at one point, uh, Archie started to do this uh, Chilling Adventures of uh, Sabrina. And I did a few, Gary Morrow was uh, editing it, and I did a few stories for him. Hmm. But I never really thought about doing the superhero stuff. That was uh, that always seemed to be too hard, too complicated for me. I, I owe my entire superhero career to uh, Joe Orlando. Oh. Um, I, at some point, I ended up doing some work for Joe, some uh, custom comic stuff. And... Um, and then he, you know, I, I did some humor stuff for him too. And then he asked me if I was interested in doing superhero stuff. And I remember saying, saying to him, Joe, that, that stuff looks so hard. It's so complicated. I, I just don't know if I'm, you know, I, I have the chops for it. And Joe looked at me and said, kid, kid, you know, you got to be able to construct a, you know, construct a plot. You can do that. You got to be able to do, do, characterization you can do that but here's the kicker it doesn't have to be funny it says they're paying you the same rate and you're only doing half the work and i thought wait a minute that's right it doesn't have to be funny you know you're doing this you know you're just doing half the work and you're getting paid the same amount i'll, I'll take a shot at that and um and joe uh put denny o'neill in touch with me and I started to do some stuff. Denny was an editor at DC at the time. I started to do some uh, freelance stuff for Denny. And um, he invited me to do Jimmy Olsen. And my first couple of Jimmy Olsen stories were probably very horrible, but, but <laughs> good enough to keep on going. Okay. So, uh, Ron, now obviously uh, Tom has started off and he's no, he's not into the superhero world. And you'd already mentioned that you were drawing and drawing and drawing. As soon as you were uh, self-aware, you had an ability to draw. Where were you drawing your inspiration from? Were you also uh, drawing from uh, comic strips or newspaper strips or real life? And when you first saw a comic, is that where you went, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this? Yeah. From the, from the time I was six or seven <clears throat> and had discovered Spider-Man and Marvel, if you ask little Ron what he wanted to do when he grew up, it was, I wanted to draw comics, work for Marvel and draw Spider-Man. That was my ambition. Um, and I, you know, that was the, you know, Ramita, Sal Buscema, John Buscema, Kirby, of course, all, you know, all those guys, uh, rediscovering Ditko. I mean, they, it was, a, it's an amazing thing. We, everybody here pretty much understands 
I don't. I, I'm assuming Nile does too. The magic yeah. of Marvel Comics in the late '60s and early '70s, you know. Uh, so yeah, all, all through my school ages, when uh, you know, into the early '70s, I was reading everything Marvel and DC, and just taking it all in. <clears throat> I mean, I loved Bob Brown and Nick Carty and Kurt Swan, of course. And I was there when they revamped Superman the first time with Kryptonite Nevermore uh, <laughs> with uh, Swan and Anderson. I mean, you know, I, that, that stuff just all had me very, very much enthralled. And I loved every, every minute of it. So I remember very distinctly, I don't remember the year, but I remember very distinctly when I read in the uh, Marvel bullpen bulletins that some yutz named Tom DeFalco was going to be the new editor on Spider-Man. <laughs> and I went, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> you know, not Jerry Conway, not Marv Wolfman, not, uh, you know, not a name that we know from Spider-Man. Tom DeFalco? What the, where the hell is he from? And oh, he's from Archie Comics. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that'll be terrific. Thank you, you know. And I remember having, you know, this the name I had never heard of before because I was, I remembered Tom's name from what he was talking about. Some of these J uh, Jimmy Olsen stories from Superman family. Oh. And I had seen the name on some of these backups in, at DC. And I, and I was just not thrilled. I was like, okay, is that how it works in this industry now? That any idiot can come in and take charge of my favorite comic book and I got to just live with it. That's great. That's great. Just live with it. So, so Ron, then, you know, it's absolutely amazing because I can guarantee you out of 1 million kids that were practicing and drawing and saying to themselves, one day I'm going to draw Spider-Man. The chances of you getting through, being in the right situation, getting to Marvel, and then being good enough to be given the assignment. Um, can you, I know obviously you, you, you broke through on Kazar, right? Kazar the Savage? I think that was my 82. first gig, yeah. That was my first regular. Yes. So you're over doing Kazar. You ended up doing some Indiana Jones and, of course, a, a lot of Star Wars. Right. Can you take us back to that moment? when who told you that you were going to be drawing spider-man and what did you do that day were you like having champagne or going out and having dinners what were you doing well no i now it, during the run on kesar spider-man guest star and oh. I, you know i was at that point when i when i first started at marvel they discovered very early what they liked the most about my work was the storytelling so i went to breakdowns pretty quickly and they they paired me with finishers like uh uh, Amando Gill on Kesar was very much a finisher and and all this. So I was I was mostly doing breakdowns, but I, for no apparent reason other than Kesar was coming to New York. And if you go to New York, if you're gonna guest star a Marvel superhero, it may as well be Spider Man. You know, I had nothing to do with that choice, but I went, ooh, okay, yeah, yeah. I get to do Spider Man, and somebody at Marvel will hopefully see it, and good things might happen. So. I, I did those issues. I enjoyed Did you spend it. a long time on each panel doing Spider-Man? Did you... We didn't have the time to spend a long time. On this <laughs> at that point, I was working days at the animation studio, working on uh, uh, local and regional TV commercials, mm -hmm. and I was doing all my Marvel work at night. So okay. I, I certainly recognized it as a possible breakthrough moment, but I wasn't going to celebrate early or anything like that. As it turned out, the editor of Marvel Team Up, because if you're the editor of Spider-Man, you're also the editor of Peter Parker, and you're also the editor of Marvel Team Up, yep. that yutz saw the KSR stuff and, <laughs> and apparently, you know, w was in a good mood that day and went, well, he didn't screw it up too bad, and decided to, to try me out on some, uh, some Spider-Man stuff. I did a Peter Parker fill-in. And I did a, uh, a team up fill in, and then I was given team up. Yeah, and then I was I worked I worked on those other team ups under you too, didn't I? Just, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then when and then th that whole transition started to happen, where he was going to transition to executive editor, and Danny Fingeroth was going to take over the Spider Man books. Now, Ron, really quick, what what was your first? honest impression of tom like okay who's that putz and all that other stuff you're saying 
but yeah, what, would, the, what well, would your honest he, opinion? He had already proven himself as the editor of Spider Man because he hired Roger Stern and John Romita Jr. to do the book, and it was mm. at a high point. I mean, so yeah. I had already eaten my words with mustard and mayonnaise. I mean, I <laughs> I already knew I was wrong about that. Um, <laughs> and the other part of it was uh, under. The, the first office I was hired by was Louise Jones, now Simonson, mm -hmm. and Danny Fingeroth uh, for Kesar and on to Star Wars and all that. That was all done out of Louise's office. And I was kind of thrown in on the deep end. I, I was working with Bruce Jones, who wrote everything in like a short story format. And uh, I, I was just kind of learning on the fly, you know. And, and a couple of times I would have conversations with Louise where I would say, it, Am I doing okay? And she goes, Have we asked you to redraw anything? And I said, No. And she went, Then you're doing fine. Just keep it coming. Um, so when Tom and I had our first, well, we, we had met already and we weren't working together when we met in Pittsburgh. I, right? I, that, yeah. It was, we met it was Tom, Tom and myself and Butch Guys uh, were at a small convention in Pittsburgh. We went out to dinner that night and we talked about the comics we love and, you know, all that kind of thing. And, Tom and I knew then that we, that we were fans of the same brand of hoo-ha, Marvel Comics excitement and all that kind of stuff. So when he did hire me, when he called me about Marvel team-up stuff, he said, now, I, I'm a bastard to work for. And I said, how do you mean that? And he goes, well, I'm going to go over the pages with you. If there's anything you're doing I don't like, I'm going to tell you and we're going to fix it and all this kind of stuff. And I went, Tom, nothing against Louise because I love her forever, and I, I do, but hallelujah. I'm, I'm thirsty for, you know, uh, pushback and, and input. Uh, so I was very enthusiastic from the very beginning to work with an editor who was going to tell me what he thought. The funny thing was that issue that, that I did as a fill-in ended up getting used on, you know, a couple of months in when they were doing the transition between Tom and Danny Fingeroth, Danny decided to go ahead and slot that fill in. It was Spider-Man and Wonder Man. And I was working with the great Mike Esposito and I was still just doing breakdowns and everything. But what was funny with you know, Tom selling himself as this hard to please bastard, when the time came for that <laughs> issue to see print under Danny Fingeroth, Danny started asking for redraws. <laughs> and I called the Falco and I said, Hey, Mr. Hardass. <laughs> now I'm redrawing. He goes, what are you redrawing? I'm going, you remember that scene you were all big about doing with the, the Ditko-esque multiple images of Spider-Man dodging all that? He goes, yeah, it worked fine. He goes, yeah, Danny wants it all small shots of Spider-Man dodging. <laughs> and he went, oh, well, that's a judgment call I wouldn't have agreed with. you know. And I said, well, you know, he's getting paid to be the editor. So I was doing redrawing. And... Uh, so, yeah, so uh, with that transition, Tom was thinking about giving me the kid who collects Spider-Man. But Danny was the one who was going to get to make the final call. And Tom explained that to me. He said, I don't know what's going to happen. You're either going to be doing the kid who collects Spider-Man or you're going to be doing the final chapter of the Thunderball story. It depends on, you know, where, where Danny comes down and what JR wants to do and all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, but, but again, you know, I, I got to do Kid Who Collects Spider-Man and everybody was on fire in that issue. Everybody just did their best work. So I think that probably helped seal the deal. I, I was originally hired on Spider-Man just for six issues while Ramita Jr. went off to get X-Men up and running. And uh, a few issues in, apparently he was in the office and Danny was happy with what Tom and I were doing. And uh, Jr. said, "Just, just give it to them. I got plenty of work on X Men." And when I first met Jr., Tom was there. When I first met Jr., I thanked him for my run on Spider Man, and we went out to dinner together, had a great time, all that kind of stuff. But uh, now, Ron, really quickly, that on that legendary story, the boy who collects Spider Man, did you particularly draw Spider Man a little more Dick Dicko esque in that? It, I got a feeling of more was, Dicko in I, that. I was doing the closest to Ditko that I could do. God, not oh, a little yeah. bit. I had my Ditko reference out. Some of them are direct lifts, for God's sakes, John. Yes. Well, Ron, let me just tell you this. At that, that time, you were doing Ditko better than Ditko. I'm sorry. It's just wow. was, it was, 
that, that and you bother. really were. Cause... And I wasn't the first. Though people forget that um, Rich Buckler was already bringing Ditko reference into his Peter Parker stuff. You know, right. You know. No, right. But I, that was when I noticed it. Uh, you see, I got into Ditko in the 80s, and I could not stand his art. Then when I got educated and I started looking back, that started. Then I was like, "Oh, the Spider-Man oh, and Doctor Strange." There it is. Well, his his original Spider-Man and Doctor Strange stuff is head and shoulders above some of the yeah. Other but when I saw your stuff, I didn't see Ditko's back stuff yet, and so I was like, "Holy crap! No, that's it, better than Dick." Like that was awesome. It Just was saying. It, what was interesting about it at the time was that Ramita's model had taken hold to such a degree. That I I was doing relative close-ups of Spider-Man, but doing the uh, reverse webbing that looks more like a flower petal type of thing. Yeah. And Danny Fingerworth was incredibly uncomfortable with it. He actually, <laughs> you know, he wasn't sure whether he was going to have Terry Austin correct it or or what. And I said, Danny, I would I would strongly urge you to just go ahead and feel the Ditko. Uh, you know, that's why I did it. I said, but you know, you're the editor, whatever you choose to do. Um, because he, because Spider Man really didn't get a chance to do anything all that Spider Man y in the story. There right. were like flashbacks of him using his powers and stuff, but mostly it was Spider Man standing or sitting, having a conversation with his kid. And I wanted him to exude Spider Man iness. Yeah. And, and the best way to do that is go back to the original Ditko model, right? You know, right. Larger head, certainly not, you know, not a Captain America body, but, a, but a, a, an athletic body. And that way, Ditko would have people standing very casually and leaning on things. I I wanted that all over the story because I wanted it. I wanted you to see Spider Man even if he was just standing. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Oh. Plus the fact, I mean, at that point, I had no idea it was going to be awarded the series to any real degree. But anytime I do a character, a, a marquee character like that, I, I didn't have the time to do it on KSR, but. With with Spider Man, you go if you don't go back and study Ditko, then you're not doing Spider Man as far as right. I'm well, we're gonna have Danny on this eventually, and I'll yell at him for you because you you did a great job. <laughs> oh, Danny was fine. He actually went ahead and left the Ditko stuff in, and I was very proud of him for that. And oh. nobody else was was doing it that far. All you right, know, Steve. A, a couple of years later. Todd McFarlane came in and blew the doors off. And, <laughs> yeah. And, oh, yeah. And had had to the webbing. You know, you can draw the webbing however you want to now. Yeah. While we're yeah. on this topic, though, I do just have a quick question for you, Ron and Tom. When when you're giving, you know, I always hear stories about, you know, uh, when certain creators, artists, writers get get an awesome IP, you know, a flagship character, a mascot to the company. Uh, but I, I never hear, like, once you get that, I know like in, in my company when we work, if someone gets promoted, sometimes we, you know, we jar them around a little, you know, hey, don't F up, don't do this. You know, we have fun with them. Did you experience any of that when you were, you know, given, when, when Spider-Man came your way, were any of the guys having some fun with you? You know, that something uh, like a funny comment there that they just kind of like haze you or anything when you got the uh, moment? Thomas, did you get teased? Well, you were you had been the editor for so long. You know, Danny decided to ask him to be the writer and mm – -hmm. You know, basically he was wasting his time asking for lists and stuff like that, you know. And, uh, and Danny yeah. had his remarks anyway. Um, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, not being in the offices all that much, I I didn't have any of that happening. I, you know, I, I felt uh, some vindication. I mean, it's six issues. That was the, the point where I decided to leave the animation studio because I figured – you know, if they're handing me Spider-Man even for six months, obviously I'll have more work after that, unless I completely screw it up. Sure. Yeah. So uh, that was when I made the decision to uh, to leave the animation studio and go full-time freelance with Marvel. Um, so it was, you know, it was big for me in all of those ways. And then, of course, when Danny said, you know, let's keep going, uh, that was fantastic. I mean, wow. I I was very aware how lucky I was. I mean, our you know Tom and I had conversations that were all about the character. He, he is completely ego free. I mean, I, I was very lucky with the people I worked with. I didn't interact with Bruce Jones much at all, but uh, Joe Duffy was a terrific collaborator, and you know, taught me a lot about being a grown up and collaborating. You know, I, I, I can remember one incident in particular where I kind of mouthed off at a convention and Joe heard me and she rightfully corrected me. 
and mm-hmm. kind of put me in my place and and I deserved it and I took it to heart and you know so there was a lot of me learning what an adult collaboration is and so yeah. I was I was in that much better shape to uh, to appreciate those lessons and to apply them with, with Tom and it was all about the characters I mean, Tom was uh, completely unjealous about where ideas came from he uh, you know, we talk about the characters for hours and hours on the phone, and from there, stories would suggest themselves. You know, and uh, uh, it was always fun to get new insights about the character, and, and he was always curious as to, you know, after reading all the guys up to that point. I mean, one of my favorite runs was Marvel and Keith Carter. You know, and we had long conversations about who we thought Pete were, and we compared and contrasted our perceptions and. You know, and it was it was it was wonderful. It was really a wonderfully creative time. So, uh, Tom, um, many people now acknowledge that the era that you're got, that you're going to begin to do this writing is a, a, a definitely a golden age for Spider-Man stories. One, you're doing you're finishing off or working with the Hobgoblin stuff that Roger Stern had worked on, and two, which is very relevant to today <laughs> you're going to be dealing with the black costume the symbiote the stuff that's taken over the spider-man universe like five billion percent so i'm curious i know that i think you uh, like collaborated on issue 251 uh, 252 if i'm correct and then 253 is all you um i'm curious when you were going to take over this project did you speak anywhere and have a conversation with Roger Stern to see, okay, did you, where was he going anywhere? Did you take a listen to his stuff and go, mm, okay. And then just, how did you go home that night or wherever you go and design this massive story that you were going to have to work with? Um, well, first off, I, when, when Danny Fingroth told me he wanted me to write Spider-Man, my, <laughs> My first reaction was, I, I can't do that kind of stuff because Spider-Man had a, a special voice. And I didn't think I could do the voice. And um, Danny said, come on, nobody knows Spider-Man like you do because I've been the editor. And I said, Danny, that's not my style of writing. I, I really don't think I can do it. And he said, well, the first two issues, Roger's already plotted. And I said, well, if Roger's already plotted, I, I can do, try the first two issues. And, um, and uh, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, you can get somebody else to script it. Uh, and I just, my, my initial time on Spider-Man, I just kept waiting to get fired. Uh, I, I, I often laugh about 252 because you had two fill-in guys doing 252, Ron and me. And um, um, 252, uh, the, the, the word had gotten out that we were going to change Spider-Man's costume. And um, we got a ton of hate mail. Um, I, I, I always remember the guy from the mailroom, a gentleman by the name Joe, he was really a sweet guy. He comes up with two sacks of mail and drops them on my desk and says to me, I don't know what you did, but don't you ever do it again. <laughs> and um, I, I, you know, I remember Shooter came in to me and, and said to me, uh, what, what issue does Spider-Man get the new costume? I said, uh, 252. He says, get rid of it in 253. Everybody hates it. I said, people think they hate it. They haven't seen it yet. Because in those days, no internet, nothing. Nobody had seen what the costume. And he said, no, no, you got to get rid of it. I said, Jim, we, we can't get rid of it until, you know, I, I knew it was coming up in, in Secret Wars, I think it was eight. And I said, we got to wait at least till Secret Wars eight before we can get rid of it. And, and to, oh, you know, sales are going to plummet. That This is going to be a disaster. And he says, listen, if sales on Spider-Man plummet, it's going to be your butt, you, 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 you know, You'll be fired. And I thought, hey, I'm going to be fired anyway. What do I care? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I convinced him to wait. Um, and uh, 
you know, uh, 252 came out and then, you know, everybody was swearing they were never going to buy another Marvel comic book. But they, <laughs> they all changed their minds. Comic book fans are a cowardly and superstitious lot. They hate everything <laughs> before it's actually in front of them. Yes. Right. Of course. Go ahead, Steve. You know, it's it's absolutely fascinating because, by the way, uh, that book didn't exist in England. Uh, I went to ev- I went everywhere, and I swear that every single person who either worked at a newsstand just took that issue and kept it for themselves. Because I saw issue uh, 251, and then I saw issue 253. I was going around like, well, did, did something happen? You know what? I, I don't understand. They're like, well, we never saw it. They all knew that they, that issue was going to be special. And as the years have gone on, you can guarantee you go to a million conventions a year. That book is coming out. People want it signed. They want it CGC. Mm-hmm. The sheer... Uh, historical power of that issue ha- means just as actually fact it means far more now you know and that key of course is the fact that then you revealed that the costume wasn't just a costume that it was actually alive okay and that opens up a whole new ball game okay i remember that classic issue where uh spider-man's wearing that bag on his head you know? yeah. uh <laughs> And then whenever you speak to fans of that era, it's funny how they can point to specific issues, specific panels, you know, specific parts of dialogue. They read that stuff a million, million times, you know, and I, for one, am a huge Roger Stern fan. I, when it comes to Roger Stern, uh, you know, he's godlike he's 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 just there up with you know just a a little bit under uh, under roy thomas as far as i'm concerned i love Uh, roger's stuff yes Mm. and for me when it comes to the spider-man run there is uh roger stern and tom defalco it just it can there's no drop off it's magnificently done and a lot of people i think don't realize you know they're like whoa that spider-man stuff was great i wonder who's doing well take a look at the credits okay that's tom defalco okay um Mm. So yeah, to me and, I, and to a lot of people, and I, ho- I hope, and I know you must realize the sheer gravitas of those issues now, uh, every single generation that comes in and starts buying Spider-Man, <laughs> they're going back and they're like, oh, I need, I got to start, I got to get 252 up, yeah. I got to get 252, yeah. I need to know everything, and that's <clears throat> what you did. I hope you realize that. Well, let's find out, let's find out, Steve. Tom, are you aware how fantastic you are? <laughs> Seriously, Tom. You move a little closer to the camera. Do you feel it, Tom? You're incredible, Tom. <laughs> Say, it. Say it. I'm incredible. Say it out loud so your wife can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I say it out loud, my wife hears me. She's just, just going to send me out with the garbage. So I... <laughs> no. Okay, Niall. See, that's why we got Niall. Look, we need him with this little eye uh, because he knows how to work the controls. Okay, <laughs> let's go to now. Let's go on to Thor. I have to go to Thor because, like I said, that was something that I needed. Okay, you saw us on our last, our last, uh, the one that we did a review on. Uh, oh, alone against the celestial. Alone against the celestial. Yeah. Change yeah. up your medication, John. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I can't. That is my medication, John. That is. <laughs> tell me. Tell me the birth of Thor, going into Thor, and then alone again up and it like you're alone <laughs> against the celestials. Either one of you. I need to know. Give it to me. It was a mistake <laughs> <laughs> from beginning to end. <laughs> Ron and I, um, uh, we, we had, at, at some point, we were taken off Spider-Man, uh, hadn't been working together for a while, like, you know, and ended up going to England, um, you know, a bunch of stuff, came back, and then uh, got in touch with Ron and trying to figure out if there was anything we could work on together, because we had such a great time working on Spider-Man together. And I found out that Ralph Macchio... Uh, uh, you know, the editor, not the actor, um, <laughs> was was looking for a new team for Daredevil. 
So Ron and I started talking about Daredevil and came up with a bunch of ideas for a series and that sort of stuff. And I, you know, went into Ralph and I said, "Hey, I he I hear you. Uh, you need um, um, a team for Daredevil. Ron and I would like to pitch." And he said, "Oh yeah, you guys would be perfect for Daredevil. You guys would be great for Daredevil." I said, but uh, he says, "Right now, I'm I'm in desperate straits." Um, you know, Thor is very late. I need a fill-in right away. I said, you need a fill-in for Thor? Um, you know, maybe Ron and I can come up with one. And um, and and, and we did. I, I, at this stage, I don't remember which was our, our first film. Yes. The Secret Wars one was the first one? Uh, yeah. 383. 383. So, so good. Okay, so we came up with that film. We put it together quickly. We you know, it, it, it was kind of a rush job, but they, you know, the Thor, Thor was late. And and as we're finishing up the job, I said to Ralph, listen, can we pitch Daredevil now? And he said, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, Thor still needs some help. Could you do a, a second film? And I said, um, yeah, okay. Now, you notice our first two fill-ins were kind of out of continuity things. Uh, the, I guess the second one was the future Thor because we were trying not to do anything because, you know, we, we wanted to do store-like story, stories without right, right. the next team. Um, so we did our second fill-in, and then uh, Ralph says, listen, I want you guys on a book. And I said, Daredevil. And he said, <laughs> oh, Thor. And I said, well, we can't do Thor. We don't do Cosmic. <laughs> and he said, you just did two issues. <laughs> and I said, Ralph, Ron and I are pros. We could do, you know, a fill-in on any any one issue and, you know, any character in, in, you know, in the line. But I don't know if we could do Thor. I mean, Thor, you need, you need somebody who can speak as Guardian. You need, you know, I said, you need a Roy Thomas. You need a Jerry Conway. You need a, you know, a Stan Lee. I can't do that stuff. And he said, ah, take a shot. And and Ron and I talked, and I found out that Thor was one of Ron's favorite characters. Oh. And uh, we, we started to, you know, put things together. And the Celestial story, <laughs> like I said, was a mistake because I thought, you know, I, I, I don't know if we can do Cosmic. We got to see if we can do Cosmic. So let's... Try to do a cosmic story, which was, you know, we started the Lester story, which was originally going to be a one-part story. And, uh, and Ralph said, no, no, it should probably be a two-part story. And um, and uh, as I was working on it, I realized I need more space. So, you know, over a weekend, I turned in, I think, the first three plots. Uh, but well, I remember, the good news I remember, was... I don't... I don't know if it's when it, when it went from one part to two parts or when it went from two parts to three parts. But at one point, you came up with the cliffhanger of the giant foot coming down. Oh, the giant foot, yeah. <laughs> the giant foot, you know, that the completely dwarfs Sarah show. And, when, and you knew that had to be a cliffhanger. So, I, I like I said, I don't know if that's when it became two parts or if that's when it became three parts. But it might have been when it became three parts. Yeah. But, Tom, it, it just kept on, like, Every issue, like it just kept the stakes got higher and higher and higher. Well, you just like it's it once again looked like you guys were having a blast doing that. And it's funny hearing you say it now and like you know the insecurities you had, but you just kept on raising the bar. Like, did you know it was going there or you would just kind of do it spontaneously? Um, you know, it's, it's you know, it's it's basic story structure. You know, yeah. as the story builds, things have to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. Um, and so we kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Ron and I, I, and I don't remember our conversations there, but we kept trying to figure out, gee, what can we do next that'll be even bigger? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the first splash page we did on our first regular issue was Shave His Beard. Yeah. And to this day, I get people complaining to me about that. When and they forget the fact that also in in those first few issues we destroyed Mjolnir. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Yes, indeed. We, we, when was, it mattered, though, he was swinging the handle around at people, and you know, and, all this <laughs> and uh, nobody brings that up because it was restored. I, I just 
I, I recorded to somebody on my Facebook page. And then you guys, you know, Walt did the great beard and then you guys shaved it off. And I said, yes. And then we brought it back. So everybody stay calm. You know. Now, did you get any pushback with destroying Milner? That never happened before. Well, it was fixed by the end of the arc. So. No, I know. Uh, yeah, oh, of course. But that yeah, was. I don't know, that, Tom, did, uh, was, did Ralph have any second thoughts about wrecking Milner? Well, when Ralph got to that, that part in the plot, he came in and said, you, you, you blew up Mjolnir? <laughs> how, how could you do that? And I said, just keep reading. Keep reading. <laughs> he said to me, I, I have to keep reading because... <laughs> That's fantastic! <Yes. laughs> but but, he, but he, he said, I have to keep reading, but but I can't believe you blew up Mjolnir. And then later on, he came back and he said, okay, everything's forgiven. It works. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That well, you know, the funny thing is that obviously if you saw, you know, the episode where me and uh, John are going into the details and really getting into it, um, yeah. for me, and I think for a lot of people now, um, that's truly, I think, one of the most grandiose and magnificent epics I think that Thor has ever put through. And it was if you, mm -hmm. I, I really say this with all sincerity. I know. I don't think anyone else. <laughs> I don't think anyone else could have matched you, even if you had put uh, Roy Thomas and John Buscema on that book. That that story right there to me made me a Thor fanatic. After I read that story, I said, "I'm going to get Journey to Mystery eighty three up. I'm going to spend everything on Thor." Uh, that's how much of an effect it had on me. And I had been reading a lot of back issues, and I was thinking, somehow this new writer. That I was uh, reading had has the voice of Stan and and Roy. I don't know how he's doing it. He reminds me, and also it was reminding me of that Jerry Conway epic against the uh, saga of the Black Stars. I don't know yeah. whether you guys remember that. That was a massive story, which was like, oh my god, it was just epic. And you were just <laughs> when that big foot came down. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether you realize that both me and John was uh, we were just like. And it wouldn't have worked. He can't, can't do this. He cannot win. Yeah. And it wouldn't have worked if you guys didn't do it in the classic sense. If it was done today, it just, I, it, it, Ron, because your art was so much like John Buscema, Sal Buscema with the Kirby, I mean, the cape. I saw it, it had to be that type of art. And, and Tom, it had to be with that type of voice. It wouldn't work today. It just, if I, if it was, and you guys were doing that. In that time, where all that Jim Lee and the, the, the all those image guys, but you guys did it the classic style, and it was bigger than any panel those guys ever did. And I have to congratulate because it swear it it caught me too. Like, what the hell? It was it was a big deal. It, it, really it brought was. a lot of attention. It brought a lot of attention to Thor. You know, and I'm I'm that '90s kid. You know, that was into oh yeah, I forgot. I didn't want to say that, but now's the '90s. Kid. <laughs> I was the 90s, you know? Go ahead now. I, you got to have that guy on the screen. Well, but, uh, you had, know, had, that was the book that was coming in, and, and yeah, my friends and stuff were buying it. When, when we were hired by Ralph, we had two choices. One was try to do a pale imitation of Walt and fail, or do what we knew and have some fun with it. You know, I mean, uh, we knew that if we embraced what we knew about Thor and what, you know, and, and re-embraced the more traditional Marvel elements because Walt knew the, the mythology better than anybody. I mean, that's, uh, he, he always has from the time he was a kid. I mean, a lot of the books he did as, as, as the uh, writer on Thor and the artist on Thor were things he had already drawn as a young man uh, in his own fan books and stuff. And he had reproduced them professionally uh so i mean he lived and breathed the actual mythology tom and i knew the marvel four uh inside and out. I, I knew him inside and out tom learned it inside and out and so we figured it was safer for us to kind of steer a little back towards that than to try to do walt and, and fail because uh, if, if we tried to copy what walt was doing it would have been a pale imitation so what we we did what fed into our own feelings about Thor and our own impressions of Thor, and we knew at least it would be entertaining because we. Be Ron, let me just tell you, that was better. I I don't care what you say, and I don't care what anyone else out there says. That was better than anything 
Walt Simonson ever done because uh, you're it, wrong. That's no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not wrong know. because no. nothing he did ever grabbed me like the way that did. And very few comics ever did when I was in my bedroom reading that. It's just that page after page, it just kept building and building. I never read yeah, very am, few comics ever hit me like I that. I am thrilled that you enjoyed it that much. But the, but the one thing we know about comics is that they're incredibly subjective. And one man's, you know, one man's miracle is another man's garbage. It just Absolutely. Happens. Yes. So, Absolutely. I mean, the one thing I wanted to mention about the Mjolnir thing, though, was it led to a really interesting conversation that I remember specifically having with Tom that has been a matter of discussion more recently where, like, I, I believe the hammer is now we know that the hammer has almost like a living soul of its own of some storm yes. god or something. Is that currently what's going on in the book? Yeah, it has a, it, yeah, it has a feminine aspect to it now. Well, okay. yes, yeah. Okay. And, and in the same way that Lockjaw, we find out Lockjaw is actually a person and not is just he? a pet. Yes, John Byrne revealed that. These things no, no. that actually open up. We, we, Tom and I had our own conversation at the time because if we're going to blow up Yolnir, just how is Thor reacting to this? Oh, is it a best friend? Yes. Is it a pet? Is it a, you know, what is it? And what we settled on after a couple of, you know, really interesting conversation was it's Excalibur. It mm -hmm. means something larger than Thor to Asgard. Odin mm -hmm. used to wield it. When he was presented with Mjolnir after Odin wielded Mjolnir, that meant something. He was a prince of the blood. It was handing Excalibur to the next generation. So... Right. It gave us a hook on how to handle the destruction of it, which is that Thor gathers up the pieces, ties them in the remnants of his cape. He's got to take them back to Asgard. They have to be sanctified and, and buried or something, you know. Yeah. But you don't just leave it on the floor in pieces, you know. Uh, and uh, I always appreciated that. I, whenever they showed, you know, I, when I went and saw the first Thor movie, and even the the one when we were on the, Thor, the TV movie, you know, how they portray Mjolnir and how they show Mjolnir was always really important to me. It, it, the hammer becomes a character in the book if you're yeah, yeah. enjoying yeah. it. You know. And you know, the uh, funny thing and, is, and since, Thor's the relationship subject, to the hammer, since you know. from the subject of the hammer, it gets even better because, and this is something that has reverence today more than ever in issue 390 you have captain america lift the hammer uh, that's all walt's fault all <laughs> walt's fault walt doesn't like it tough mr simonson i respect you to death but it's all your fault if you wouldn't have had beta ray bill lift the damn thing nobody else would have lifted the damn thing yeah <laughs> yeah i i remember um when i read the issue um you know it was odd because one, you know, there's the, I'm this little English kid and I'm like, Oh, so Captain America can lift the hammer, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> and then I thought, well, wait a minute. I began to think, and I probably think Tom, that you probably thought this Steve Rogers. I mean, no human can actually be like Steve Rogers. I mean, he's just like some sort of weird angel type guy that's never done anything wrong. It's really weird. Uh, and so after a while, I was like, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go with it. So I'm concerned. I'm, I'm wondering, Tom, when you were writing that scene, what was going through your mind? Was it like, well, Steve Rogers is pure of heart. He can do this. What was going on? Um, who suggested <laughs> well, there was a whole bunch of things going on there. I think, um, you know, Ron and I had been discussing, you know, who, you know, could anybody else lift the hammer? And I think uh, Brett Breeding suggested, you know, Steve Rogers. And um, around that well, time, what? Well, actually, what, what it was, Tom, if, you, if, if I may refresh your memory a bit, we, we were just bringing Thor back to Earth after his adventures in space. Right. And what was going on in the other continuity was the armor wars. Yeah. Was, and, and Mark Runewald was doing the stories with the captain going after Iron Man because of the armor wars. And turning his shield back in and all this kind of stuff. And they were in conflict. So one of the things that we wanted to deal with with Thor coming back to Earth is 
which side does Thor take in a conflict between Captain America and Iron Man? And in the okay. course of the story, we needed something to bring Thor down on Captain America's side. Ah. Because if you read that story, Cap tells the story about, you know, getting kicked out of being Captain America, and Thor says, oh, let's go overthrow the government. And Cap goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and then he also tells the story about Iron Man and all this kind of stuff. And Thor is really stuck because Iron Man's his closest friend on Earth. You know, he knows Tony. He knew Tony's identity before anybody else did. Uh, and Tony knew his identity before anybody else did. So as far as the Avengers goes, Iron Man was always Thor's closest friend. And even though he would, you know, he'd go to the gates of hell for Captain America, that was never in doubt. But he, you know, that's one of the things about humans that Thor is frustrated by is that we never say what we mean. As Guardians say what they mean at all times. Right, you know? right. There's very little subterfuge unless you're Loki, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we needed something by, we knew we wanted Thor to side with Captain America because Tony was being an ass at the time. <laughs> and we, you know, so we, we needed that something. And, and a separate conversation was, again, Walt opening up the idea of whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, which he brought up again, you know, he opened that door with Beta Ray Bill, was, you know, Brett and I had a discussion at one point where he said, you know, if anybody is worthy enough to pick up the hammer in the Marvel Universe, you'd think it'd be Steve Rogers, wouldn't you? And oh, it was a conversation yeah. that intrigued me, so I passed it on to Tom, and it was, you know, might have gone into a notebook somewhere or something, but during the course of that discussion, it's like, well, what can we have happen that would convince Thor to take Steve's side in this conflict? Lifting the hammer pretty much does it, you know, which which I find interesting in Avengers uh, Age of Ultron. Uh, yep. Why does Thor trust the vision? Because he lifted Mjolnir. And, you know, even though the other Avengers were saying, yeah, but you put the hammer in an elevator, the elevator goes up. The elevator didn't really lift the hammer, you know, talking about him being a machine. And right. because he lifted me on there. The stone is safe with him. I'm, you know, I, I trust him. And so I thought it was interesting that, you know, Joss Whedon used the same rationale we did, is that uh, if you can lift the hammer, you get a free pass on some of the other stuff, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, funny thing is, on a on a side note, when I became an Overstreet advisor and I was rewriting the entry for Thor, <laughs> I was very proud of the fact that I had singled out issue 390 and I said, you know, Captain America lifts the hammer. And so the book's published and I'm going around my fellow dealers and like, see, look what I've done. And they're like, oh, well, okay, Steve, whoopee do. And I remember I was like crushed. I was like, don't you realize how important this is? It has to be noted. You know, and they were like, uh, Steve. You know, you're taking this Overstreet stuff too far, whatever it was. <laughs> so, in the age of Ultron, when I'm I'm sitting there and I see that little scene, I was like, "Is, is, is he going to do it?" And then, of course, as we know, <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah. In the end game, when he lifts the hammer. By the way, I'm vindictive. I went to every single one of those dealers after that film came out. I was like, do you remember me? I told you, issue 390 of Thor, big book, big book. So anyway, I just want to let you guys know that's, uh, that's how petty I can be sometimes. But Cap had lifted the, the hammer far more obviously in later books before Endgame. Uh, because in all fairness, um, Tom is a weasel and will, will never commit to anything. So you can read that book and you can say, well, Steve didn't really lift the hammer. Thor was calling for the hammer. Cap had his hands on the hammer no. and he swung it like a shot put to get it to Thor. But did he really wield the hammer? Because he doesn't wield it as obviously as, yes. Chris, as Chris Evans does in Endgame. Yes. And when Eric lifted the hammer for three seconds before he got his chest blasted out by Mongoose, <laughs> you know, we weren't saying Eric Masterson is worthy. 
we were saying Thor needed that damn hammer. Oh. And Eric had his hands on it at the time. So I don't have a problem with that kind of ambiguity. Um, at the time, I found it hilarious because <laughs> that, Tom, Tom loves to be Mr. Ambiguous and kind of. <laughs> Because you know he doesn't he's not walking around looking for I'm the guy who had Captain America lift Thor's hammer because it's one, he was the captain instead of Captain America. And and two, who needs that kind of adjective? You know, I mean the yeah. fans get all worked up and everything. Just so when people right afterwards, when people go, I can't believe you had Captain America lift Thor's hammer went, did he? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you think so, he did. So Here's a quick question. You, uh, you're you on the Thor title by accident. You wanted to do Daredevil. You're on it. When when did you get uh, an idea that the sales were th that good and you were doing a very good job and Marvel were like, wow, the sales are great. When, how, how long did it take for that to come through to you? Yeah, Tom. <laughs> I, I don't honestly don't recall, but I, I know that at, at one point the... A guy in charge of newsstand sales came in and told me we were selling over 50% on the newsstand. And I said, I, I, I said, no book sells over 50%. This is no book except yours. And I said, okay, sounds good. And um, we were, we, we were kind of, you know, I think I called Ron and said, Hey, we're selling 50% on the newsstand. And, I think your reaction was only 50%. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we were, you know, we, we were doing well. They, you know, it's, I, 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 this shouldn't come across as false modesty. Um, but, you know, Ron and I, we considered ourselves kind of journeymen, guys who were, you know, kind of still learning how to how to control the medium, mm -hmm. and we're we're constantly looking at the work, trying to figure out how we can make it better. Um, so I, you know, I'm not sure we've ever, you know, either one of us ever sat back and said, "Oh man, we're doing a great job. We could just coast that's, from here." That's when it all goes away, man. That's when it all goes away. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you though, when you guys are writing that Thor, like. You know, when people saw Superman for the first time in the movies, they were saying, oh, like little kids would go out in the parking lot and pretend they could fly. I was a little older and I read your stuff and I used to go outside and I'd be like, are those celestials out there? Like I, <laughs> I would I would play that in my head. You guys impacted me that much. And, I, you know, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And, uh, you know. If, if we can get you guys back on another time, and I, Tom, I'll definitely want to go into your editor in chief stuff. But now, you got anything to say to these guys? You got any questions for? Well, you know, I, there was one thing I kind of wanted to jump into, and this was a, a photo from your personal collection, John. Just want to put it up here. Look, looks like this was a good time here. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to mention that, like you're having too much fun at the Marvel offices. Tom, what is going on here? Um, <laughs> so he met his wife. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just the, guys, the guys bought you a dancer for your birthday. Or I, I guess, I guess so. I, um, uh, I don't. I, I'm sorry, but I don't even recall the. the <laughs> I know you had some liquor on the hand too, so maybe that's true. Well, I, I often had liquor in the hand. I, I used to keep a. <laughs> I used to keep a bottle of scotch at the bottom in my desk drawer um, because oftentimes I know you'll, you'll be surprised to hear this. You have a couple of creative people uh, in the room and things would get heated. Ah. So when things would get heated, I grab the guys, sit them down, give them both a, both a drink and <laughs> wow. you know, try, try to try to smooth things out. I, I also remember at one point Peter David sold his first novel. So I brought him into the room. I said, we got to celebrate, Peter. And I brought out the bottle of scotch. I poured him, poured him a shot, poured me a shot, saluted him, took a taste and spit it out. I go, what is this stuff? And I held up the bottle. Scotch, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I kind of had an old uh, editor's, you know, mentality about that sort of stuff. Um, you know, editors and writers are, you know, they they should be in constant conflict. Because mm -hmm. editor, an editor's job is to look at the long term health of the character and what's best for the character in the long term. And the writer's job is to think short term. You know, how do I you know, make this the best story I can? But in, in the course of making this the best story I can, do I do I screw something up in the future? Um, so there's always a, a conflict between, you know. But Tom, from yeah. a very humble guy that you are, I mean, and from those days of Archie, you went all the way to the top of the mountain. I mean, you got to become the editor in chief and you, you had, you know, uh, during a lot of chaos and all that stuff. But I mean, you really, you really, you really did a lot better than you say. I mean, like, just so you say, I'm going to just tell you, did a, like, you know, almost like a Roy Thomas story. He comes be, being a fan and then goes all the way to the top of the mountain and like starts running the show and caring for these heroes. You did the same thing. And it's like, you, you should be praised for that. And you, you're one of the, you're on that list. You and you're the more important guys. I why do you think we all call you the legendary Tom DeFalco? Yes. I know why you call me the legendary Tom but, DeFalco. But you know, Tom, it's not like you made that up and put it on before your name. No, the masses, the faceless masses that look up at you as to a god. The truth is, I did make it up. <laughs> you did? I did. No. At one point, I was, you know, the, 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 at one point, I, I, I was, you know, talking to Michael Jackson's people. And we were going to do something with Michael Jackson. And I found out in the contract you were contractually obligated to refer to him as the king of pop. Um, so I called Ron and I said, listen, if, if you're contractually obligated to refer to Michael Jackson as the king of pop from now on, I want to be known as the legendary Tom DeFalco. So whenever Ron would call, he'd say, can I speak to Mr. Legendary? <laughs> <laughs> legendary Tom DeFalco. Every time I refer to him on my Facebook page, and other people he, have picked it up in podcasts and on other TV. people picked it up. The first time somebody said to me, you know, introduce me as the legendary Tom DeFalco. I thought I thought he was busting my chops via Ron. <laughs> so, no, no, they took it very seriously, more seriously than I do. But, we'll add but, edit to the uh, or, or, or I do either. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I, I do want to make, you know, the store in the celestial uh, saga. Um, I want to mention, you know, what was always my favorite scene in that whole saga. Oh, yeah. When when Thor, Thor first confronts the Celestial, he gives him a chance to surrender. <laughs> Which I thought, you know, hey, this is Thor. Yes. Of course, he's going to be noble. He's going to yeah. give him a chance to surrender. Yes. And then when the, 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 the Celestial ignores him, he just thinks he thinks this is a rude creature. <laughs> You know, it's amazing, um, and I explained to uh, a million people, by the way, um, I used to have a vast stock of that little tiny trade paperback that came out, uh, Alone too. Against the Celestials, and I would sell that all the time to people who would come into the store for the first time if they were interested in Thor, and they'd say, hey, what's the perfect Thor story? That's the one I, you know, I don't have access to it anymore, it's way out of print, but I had a lot of those, a lot of those trades. Me too. Um, for me, the little scene right at the end when the Celestials fix the planet and then they're explaining to Thor that he should never, ever get involved again. And Thor's reaction. And I was thinking to myself, this writer gets it. Yeah. This writer gets it. The Celestials are on another level. And that story afterwards made me think of a reverence. I was like, oh, my God. If the Celestials really want to do something, there's nothing that can really stop them, you know. And that was part, but just those little sequences that shows that you got it, Tom. You understood it. And in recent years, and again, I don't want to start getting on a negative thing, but a lot of modern writers they don't get it. So they'll, no. you know, I'll read a story and, and then I'll just go, ah, I'm done. I'm out. I'm out. That's stupid. Okay, 
Because they don't get it. They never did their research. They'd never heard of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. They didn't know anything. But that little sequence right there, oh, I remember thinking, oh, my God, this is genius. Okay. And, oh, of course, we're running out a little bit of time right now. Are we? we haven't okay. even touched Thunderstrike, Eric mm -hmm. Masterson. We haven't touched that Fantastic Four run, which I love and adore. We haven't got anywhere near that yet. There's plenty more for us to get into and really dig into. Yeah. And, and as Steve told you and you guys told your best part, my best part was right at the beginning, Tom. And Ron, you drew it like incredible. He didn't have any questions to ask. You know, he just knew something was happening to this planet. And he had to do something about it because that was his code of honor. And then he just gets into his armor and you just see that. It's just, I fell in love with it. And I, once again, Ron, Tom, I'm going to say this again. <laughs> that is some of the best Thor ever written. And if you guys were inspired by other things of past, like Walt and all that, I respect that. But that was just so powerful for me that I, you know, I, I almost tear up because it's just, I, I remember... It making me feel like I could do anything. And, and, John, and hey, John, it, it's hard for us to listen to this without smiling and laughing. But listen, I know you, you I asked know. me. You asked me early on uh, whether I've, I've won any awards and things like that. And I, you know, I've I've been recognized for a couple of things. The best reward I ever get in this job is being a part of somebody's personal history, being a part of somebody's childhood, being part of a, of a, of a fond memory and being part of that is the greatest honor in the world. So, you know, the, the best award I could ever ask for is how much you and Steve and everybody who read those books, how much they enjoyed. Them. I mean, we giggle because we're embarrassed and we're stupid that way, but you know, <laughs> We definitely have people that we looked up to the same way, works that affected us the same way. A lot of the work that Tom and I have done, when I think about it, sitting alone in my car, there's more than a few scenes that choke me up to this day yeah. that Tom and I were able to execute. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take those two dimensions and those printed words and create this alchemy that hopefully makes somebody feel something whether it's excitement or sadness or happiness or joy or whatever, the fact that we've been able to do it at all is, is a gift and, and uh, something. And unfortunately, yeah. and unfortunately you don't get that today. Like, cause you guys thought about that. You get stories that are decompressed and then they're like, they're so satirized and they're so, they just been done over and over. It meant, I, I don't know. I, it, you guys were at a, a doing it at a special time too. Like I said, all that image stuff was coming, and when when I was reading that at the time when I needed that, it was it was so perfect, and it was just awesome. And I want to thank you guys for me. And just so you know, when I go with Roy all over the world, I he gets that all the time. He has hundreds and thousands of people getting his autograph, and they everyone talks about how he changed their lives. And that's what I do for, and I understand that because I'm one of those people. And that's what I like to give to you. And this is a big reason my John, I mean, uh, Steve and Niall, we do this podcast. It's about that passion. And I want, and giving respect to you creators. And whether you like it or not, or you blush, I'm telling you, you guys changed my life and for the better with those comics. And it was unbelievable. So Tom, I thank you so much for being here. Ron, you too. I mean, you guys are legends. And regardless, you made a little John Cimino feel like he could fly so i thank you for that steve any last words uh you know uh obviously i have been gushing a lot i don't mean to embarrass you guys <laughs> <laughs> but again uh it's an honor and I, I really appreciate you guys taking your time uh you know and, and speaking with us today and i really hope and pray that we get a lot of people looking at this podcast and then getting intrigued and looking into your work i want them to do that that's my goal. I, yeah. I really appreciate you guys. And, uh, you know, I just want, I want a lot of other people to, to read your work. And Niall, you got anything? Pop XP, yeah. we love you. Thank you for having yeah, us on your pocket. Niall, last I mean, word here. As much as uh, you guys love the Thor and everything, for me, man, it really was the 252. When I saw that black suit, I was sold. I was sold. Spider-Man was cool to me. 
and and that's my favorite i mean aesthetically that's my favorite spider-man also the story was amazing and what really brings my attention to you guys uh before we go is just seeing that you guys are continue working and we can touch on this another time we can talk about this after but you know yeah. i caught wind of this you know a while back that you guys were doing your own book as well and and you're still pushing and doing different things so I, again thank you for coming on i mean you guys are a true inspiration you really are from the art to the writing yes and still I mean, working with sal basema yes who is on my arm <laughs> okay that looks, that looks more like the hulk steve <laughs> <laughs> i Please. actually have so i actually have sal basema on my body but i can't <laughs> <laughs> if you can please extend you know, uh, my my personal love for Sal Buscema. I'm the biggest Sal Buscema fan in the world. I've had that on my arm since 1985. And please, uh, yep. yes, anytime. There's yes. proof. <laughs> There's proof. San Diego, <laughs> yes. San Diego Comic Con, that's 1995. That's right that's there. Yeah. That's Steve? Yes. That's Steve. <laughs> I was young once. <laughs> Fanny pack and all. Fanny yeah, pack, right. yes, 1995. Mm. Jeez, they made their way look back. like the same guy anymore. Yeah, I know. I went. I had a. You know. He just kept getting Captain bigger and bigger. Pike. Captain. Pike. Hey, I don't look like uh, the Star same Trek. guy either. Oh, well, Captain. I mean, Pike. Steve kept getting bigger, and you kept getting smaller, Tom. <laughs> so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Pop XP, Nile, Billy Tucci. We love you. We're going to have you on here, and Tom and hey, Ron. Billy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Billy's and love you guys and thanks for everybody and, and thanks, once gentlemen. again, Pop XP, thanks Thank for you. having us and uh, we're gonna have them again, obviously. Thank you, everybody. Steve, get us out of here. Spinning right. mighty Mister Camillionaire. Thanks, guys. Boom. <laughs> Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.